Welcome to Partners in Pancreatic Cancer. My name is Koshik Das, and I'm in the Division of Gastroenterology at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm frequently asked, what are pancreatic cystic lesions? Do they carry a cancerous potential? What should we do about them? Cystic lesions of the pancreas are increasingly being identified clinically and are now recognized as an, as an entity entirely distinct from pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is what we traditionally think of as pancreatic cancer. They are a set of lesions, broadly speaking, divided between benign lesions like serous cyst adenomas or simple cyst pseudocysts, and those with malignant potential like mucinous cystic neoplasms, IPMNs or intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms, and other rare cystic conditions of the pancreas, including syndromically associated pancreatic cysts like those in von hippel lindau syndrome. So what's the prevalence of pancreatic cystic lesions? In a recent study uh, looking at about 2,800 patients who underwent outpatient abdominal CT scans um, without an indication for pancreatic disease, the researchers found that about 2.6% of all of these patients were found with some sort of cystic lesion in the pancreas. And very interestingly, as you look at patients uh, at older age, amongst those with, who are over the age of 80, 8.7% of patients had some sort of asymptomatic cystic pancreatic lesion. So what percentage of these lesions, symptomatic or asymptomatic, are actually malignant? Amongst, in, the, in a surgical cohort, noting the certain biases associated with having a surgical cohort out of the Mass General Hospital, uh, Dr. Fernandez del Castillo described that in uh, asymptomatic patients, about 16% were malignant and 42% were potentially malignant when, uh, when uh, explant was performed, surgery was performed. Among symptomatic patients, about 30% were malignant, and 40% had the potential for malignancy. Looking at the epidemiology of the different cystic neoplasms of the, uh, of the pancreas, first, serous cyst adenomas typically occur in women in the seventh decade of life and account for about one-third of cystic neoplasms. Malignant transformation of these cysts is extraordinarily rare. Mucinous cystic neoplasms, uh, the second type, occur also more in women in the fifth decade li of life and account for 10 to 45 percent of cystic neoplasms. Resection is generally curative in this population regardless of the degree of epithelial dysplasia. However, when invasive adenocarcinoma is present, uh, poor prognosis is associated. It is for this reason that resection is generally recommended for these lesions. Intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms, or IPMN, occur equally between men and women and typically occur later in life, in the sixth or seventh decade, and account for about one-third of cystic neoplasms. There's an excellent prognosis for lesions that show only adenomatous change or borderline cytologic atypia, but poor prognosis with invasive carcinoma. Focusing in on IPMN for a moment, as they are an increasing um, bedeviling problem for clinicians, as opposed to traditional PDAC, IPMNs have been shown to have two different cancer types that develop from them tubular carcinoma and colloid carcinoma of the pancreas. Being able to assess first which type of cystic lesion you're dealing with and second assessing the lesion's individual risk for developing cancer is emerging to be an extremely challenging clinical task. Clinical criteria, notably the Sendai guidelines first published in 2006 that were updated in 2012 as the Fukuoka guidelines, have attempted to address the question of how to manage IPMN that may or may not warrant surgical resection. What is becoming clear is that while there is certainly malignant potential for patients with IPMN, their definitive malignant fate is anything but certain. There are epithelial subtypes of IPMN, each of which carry a different risk of development of pancreatic cancer, and anatomic subtypes that have demonstrated that lesions associated with the main duct have a particularly increased risk of neoplasia. There's been an intense desire to augment the adopted clinical criteria to identify those lesions that would particularly benefit from surgical resection. These attempts have included looking at things like pancreatic juice for mutations in KRAS, TP53, and GNAS mutations. In addition, investigators have looked at methods to evaluate uh, cis fluid aspirated via endoscopic ultrasound for different markers, proteins, gene mutations, or other targets, but no clear definitive panel has emerged to be particularly effective. Furthermore, traditional cytology has been a mainstay in cis fluid analysis, and while highly specific with a great positive predictive value, it lacks sufficient sensitivity to be used alone. So this actually remains a very hotly debated, discussed, and researched field to try and find effective screening tests. More effective tools are needed to stratify those patients that would benefit from surgical management, that is Whipple surgery, from those that would benefit from watchful waiting or, quite frankly, no watchful waiting at all. This is still an active area of interest, certainly of mine and many others in the field. Thank you for viewing this activity. For additional resources, please view our other educational activities on partnersinpancreaticcancer.com.